So the second video on structure and bonding um, begins with the three states of matter. And if you look at the spec page that we've got on the screen here, um, and you look at the particle model diagrams, you'll see that this is very, um, very much um, starts from the from what you learnt perhaps in year seven uh, about particle model or particle theory and the ideas of different structures of solids, liquids, and gases. And hopefully uh, you were introduced at the time to the idea that there were forces of attraction between those particles. And one of the things that we've been learning in the GCSE so far is uh, much more about those forces of attraction. So when we look at the spec, we're looking at being able to describe the particle model, um, to describe the three states of matter, using that um, to explain changes in state and um, to also exp to understand or appreciate um, what determines different melting points and boiling points um, with different substances. Uh, there isn't really very much to say initially about the particle model. Uh, it, we're just going to run through it again, um, but that's really about um, so that we've got something um, secure to hold on to when we talk through the rest of the topic. But by and large, um, anything that's specifically or any questions specifically about the particle model in any exam questions tend to be of the sort that you could do based on your year seven knowledge. So we've got a table here for the different states of matter. Um, we've got sort of a basic particle arrangement and um, we're going to fill in this table. And I'm, I'm probably going to maybe use terms or language that uh, perhaps wasn't what you used in year seven, um, but which is correct, uh, but which maybe ties in the particle model a little more with what we're doing at GCSE. So if we think about uh, the solid, if we work on a solid to begin with, um, and we're looking at just at volume, shape, and density, then um, one of the things that you can very clearly see, and you've always seen with a solid particle diagram, is that there is a regular and repeating pattern. So you know exactly, if you were to add more particles, you would know exactly how and where to add them. And what we understand now from our GCSE is that if we are talking about something that has a regular and repeating pattern, then we are talking about a lattice structure. Um, we can also see that there's very little space between the particles, um, and so solids would have the greatest density out of the three states of matter. Let's now consider the energy of the particles. So um, one of the things that we, uh, we learnt in, in year seven is the idea about how those particles are vibrating about a fixed position. Um, what that's telling us is that, uh, or what's going to be the case relative to the other states of matter, is that the, the energy of those particles is low. Um, when we think about whether a solid can be compressed, um, when we're talking about compression, we're basically saying, is it possible to have the same number of particles occupying a smaller volume? That's what really we mean by compression. Compression is not about changing shape, it's about changing volume. Um, there is little space between the particles uh, in a solid. It is not possible to squeeze them really any closer. So um, it isn't possible to reduce the volume of a certain number of particles to basically, it's, it's not possible to increase the density. So um, they can't be compressed. Um, the next one, um, what we're thinking about here is in that state of matter, how could we um, judge the strength of the attraction uh, the force of attraction between the particles and in a solid um, the very fact that they're in a fixed position the very fact that they are unable they are not free to move tells us that those forces of attraction are very strong and then when it comes to the question of whether a solid can flow um, it really boils down to the fact of whether the particles themselves can move and they are in fixed positions so they can't move so no a solid can't flow so if we turn to a liquid and um, if we just consider uh, the arrangement of the particles in a liquid compared with a solid, one of the things that we've definitely lost is that idea of a regular and repeating pattern. So what we've what we've got now is an irregular pattern. However, uh, one feature that is common with solids is that the particles are still um, very close together. Now, when we're thinking about the energy of the particles, uh, they may have an irregular, there may be an irregular pattern, but one crucial difference between a liquid and solid is that the um, particles are now free to move. So they're essentially swapping places. This means that they, they have more energy than the particles in the solid. 
Um, as we're making a comparison between the three states, uh, I'm going to phrase this as medium energy. And what we're saying is it's more energy, certainly more energy than the particles had when they were in the solid state. When we come to compression, it's still uh, the same question we're asking ourselves. Uh, can we squeeze the particles closer together so that they take so that the whole um, substance takes up less volume? And um, just as with solids, when they, the particles were very close together, that is the same um, with liquids, perhaps slightly less close together than solids, but really not really talking anything significant. And so the answer is still no, um, liquids can't be compressed. In terms of forces of attraction, um, the, the particles are now free to move, um, but they can never get away from each other, um, as it were. So they're always essentially in contact. They're always essentially close together. So we would describe this, uh, the strength of the force of attraction here as being strong. And then um, because the particles themselves can actually move, because they can swap places, um, yes, liquids are capable of flowing. So when we come to gas, we can see there's a, there's a big difference here. We can see that the uh, particles are very spaced out, or very there are, there are large distances between the particles. Um, they're very much moving uh, very quickly in sort of random directions, in straight lines, but in random directions. They're going to collide with each other. They're going to collide with the walls of the container. That's what causes pressure, or, or, or that's the results in pressure. And so then when we think about the energy of the particles, uh, they have um, high energy, especially when compared with liquids and especially when compared with solids. Uh, because there are large spaces between the particles, it is possible to push them or squeeze them together so that um, we can have the uh, same number of particles in a smaller volume. So gases can be compressed. So that is a key difference between them and solids and liquids. Uh, the fact now that the particles have these great distances between them, uh, they're not really interacting with each other unless they collide with each other, tells us that the forces of attraction between them are weak. And then because the particles are capable of moving, um, gases can flow. So just make sure that you, you appreciate really those um, similarities and differences between the, the three states in Matiga when, uh, when they're viewed as a collection of particles. So this is a, a graph that shows how the temperature of a substance uh, changes as you heat it up. Um, so we've got um, various parts to it, which we just need to label. So at the beginning, we're starting with a solid. Uh, we then have partway through or halfway through, we have it in as a liquid. And then at the end, we have it as a gas. So where you see uh, the flat lines, um, that's where um, we've got a change of state. So I'm just going to label um, because it'll make it a little bit easier to um, talk about um, what's happening. So that's A, then we've got B, C, D, E, and F. Okay, so between A and B, um, what's happening is we have our solid. Uh, we can see that as time goes by, uh, the amount of energy that's being supplied to the solid is increasing. So what we've got is we've got the particles in the solid vibrating faster and faster and faster, but they're still in their fixed positions. At point B, that is when the change of state starts to happen. So at point B, it is completely solid. At point C is when it is now completely liquid. So the entire state change has taken place. Between B and C, what's happening is we are overcoming forces of attraction. So if you remember, the forces of attraction in a solid were very strong. Those in the liquid are strong. Um, so we are making that change, and that requires energy. And so the temperature of the substance doesn't change, even though we're continuing to put energy in, because we are the very act of changing state, the very act of overcoming the forces of attraction between the particles is requiring the energy that we're supplying. And then once we've converted all of our solid into liquid, uh, then we then the temperature starts to rise again. Uh, the liquid particles are, are in a regular order. They are moving um, around, swapping positions. And as we increase the temperature, the, the speed of their motion or the speed of them moving around is increasing. And then when we get to point D, 
that is now the point at which um, that's the boiling point and that is um, the point at which the liquid is now going to begin to change state into a gas so just as we had before at uh, point D it's it's completely liquid at point E it's completely gas between D and E is um, the change of state we are again overcoming forces of attraction um, and so that requires energy so we're still supplying energy but the temperature of the substance um, doesn't change and then once we've changed the liquid completely to gas then as we um, supply even more energy then we are increasing the temperature further so changing state requires overcoming forces of attraction now all substances pretty much anyway nearly all substances can exist in the three states of matter solid liquid and gas um, but they they can have very very different melting points they can have very very different boiling points so and, and essentially what those melting and boiling points are a, a measure of or a judgment of is how much energy is required to um, to change state to change from a, from a solid to a liquid um, to change from um, a liquid to a gas so that amount of energy is going to depend on the strength of the forces of attraction so the melting point the boiling point are essentially giving us um, a lot of information as to the strength of those forces of attraction so a very high melting point tells us that that substance has very strong forces of attraction between the particles and a very low melting point would tell would show us that the the forces of attraction between the particles was much weaker so how strong those forces are is going to depend on two things it's going to obviously depend on bonding that's something that we were looking at in the previous video and all of it has been about electrostatic forces of attraction but we've got to still think about um, the strength of those forces of attraction and then also on top of that is going to be the structure of the substance how those particles are arranged so here we're taking our particle model um, a little bit further so we have um, four solids, all right? Well, that's how we're thinking them to begin with, okay? Four solids. And we've got our regular repeating arrangement. We've got our lattice structure. Uh, now, what differs between them? Now we understand about different bonding and different structures. What differs between them is what are those actual particles? What do they represent? So in an ionic compound, we have alternating um, positive and negatively charged ions. Uh, in a simple molecule substance, each of those particles is a single molecule. So here in methane, each particle is CH4. In a giant covalent structure, such as diamond, uh, each one of those particles is a carbon atom. And we know that there are covalent bonds between those carbon atoms in diamond. And then finally, in metallic um, we have uh, our regular repeating pattern, this time of m positively charged metal ions, um, we've got the, we've got to show the delocalized electrons. We've got to have them there, but they themselves are not being treated as particles as far as our uh, particle model is concerned. So you can see the regular arrangement. You can see the you know the four by four rows. They tell us what those actual particles um, are when we now look at the substances and think about their bonding and think about their structure. So when we consider um, the forces being overcome when changing state um, in an ionic compound we are talking about a strong electrostatic force of attraction between oppositely charged ions in all directions. That, op that attraction is in all directions. Now those forces are um, strong and so um, for something like sodium chloride its melting point is about 800 degrees Celsius so that's high. Um, in the, our simple molecule here, so this is a, we're going to have a new term now, something that we haven't come across before. We are talking now about intermolecular forces. So intermolecular is a new word. Now, if you think about other words with, um, with inter as part of them, like interview or international or internet, Inter means between, and then molecular mean, means molecules. So we are talking about 
forces of attraction between the molecules. And crucially, these are weak. So our melting or boiling point is um, low. So I think about um, minus 185 degrees Celsius. So a huge difference between uh, the melting point of methane and that of um, sodium chloride. The exact temperature doesn't really matter. It's just to give us a ballpark idea. If we're looking at diamonds, um, here what we're actually having to overcome or what we're having to, to break in this instance are covalent bonds. And covalent bonds are very strong. So what we've got here is a melting point that is very high, sort of over 4,000 degrees Celsius. And then with metallic, our forces of attraction are between our positively charged metal ions and our sea of delocalized electrons. Uh, they are strong, uh, and we have, again, a high melting point. Um, I think it's approximately 650 degrees Celsius, but I could be slightly wrong there. And so if you, know, if you look here, we've got four different types of substances. We've got an ionic substance, we've got a simple molecular substance, we've got a giant covalent substance, and we've got a metallic substance. Three out of the four are solid at room temperature. So sodium chloride, for example, you know, common salt, you know that's a solid at room temperature. Diamond, you know, is a solid at room temperature. All metals except mercury are solids at room temperature. So you're, as a rule of thumb, as a useful rule of thumb, if something is solid at room temperature, i.e. when you're experiencing the world in an everyday way, if it's a solid at that, in, the, in, in the world as it normally is, then you can basically assume that the forces of attraction involved between the particles are strong. If, however, it's certainly if it's a gas and if it's a liquid, or if it's a liquid, then we are talking about weak or weaker forces of attraction. So think about oxygen, think about um, uh, methane, think about nitrogen, think about water. They are all gases, or in water's case, they're a liquid. They are simple molecular substances. We would describe them as having weak forces of attraction between the molecules. Okay, so one of the things that the uh, specification uh, stresses is that you have to appreciate the limitations of the particle theory, just like um, it mentioned about understanding the limitations of the different um, different ways of, uh, or the different models, or the different ways of displaying, sorry, uh, ionic compounds and so on. Now, I, I'm not really going to say very much about it. They're almost just simply statements I just want you to just ha I'll just pause the video and, and read them. But um, I think if you're going to get a, if there's going to be a question on on something like this in an exam, it's going to be one mark, um, and hopefully just try and say something that's sensible, um, and just think about what when you're thinking about the particle model, what are you assuming, and then think is it fair to make that assumption. Uh, much more important and something that extends really beyond this topic uh, is is our state symbols. So um, we've got four state symbols. Um, so we've got three states of matter, but we've got four state symbols. So three of them are the states of matter, um, as, we'll, as we'll see. So we've got to state what they mean. And, and the thing is, they, they can ask a question along the lines of, you know, what does AQ mean or something like that. Um, but really, their use is beyond that. The importance is beyond that, as, as I'll hopefully show you. So the four state symbols are um, S for solid, L for liquid, G for gas, so there are three states of matter. And then the fourth, which is incredibly important, um, the AQ stands for aqueous, but what we're saying here is we're saying dissolved in water, and we're talking therefore about something being a solution. Um, a vast majority, I think it's fair to say, of uh, reactions that you probably are either going to study or do, um, at GCSE and beyond um, will involve at least one of the materials, one of the substances being aqueous, being dissolved in water. And just even in your body, you, you are 70% water. There are myriad reactions taking place in your body, all in an aqueous environment. So we've got an example uh, equation, reaction equation here. And uh, something else I just want to point out before we carry on with this is that um, in exam papers, they don't always tell you the state symbol, and that's because uh, whatever the it's it's a it, the state symbol state symbol is going to be there if it's relevant to what they're asking.
asking you at some point a question about. So if they don't give you the state symbols, it's because they weren't important to whatever they wanted to assess you on. If they do give you the state symbols, almost certainly there is going to be a question in which your appreciation of those state symbols is going to be relevant, and it isn't going to be as necessarily as simple as what does AQ stand for. So let's have a look. Uh, let's have a look at uh, this particular equation. So this is a um, an acid-base reaction, so it's a neutralization reaction. So that will come up in um, C4 when it's um, uh, chemical changes. So we have got calcium carbonate, um, which is also a common substance in GCSE. Um, so chalk, limestone, marble, they're all made of car uh, calcium carbonate predominantly. Um, and we can see that it's got the same symbol S, and that's because if we look underneath, we've got that sort of white powder, that's our calcium carbonate. Then that's reacting with hydrochloric acid, um, HCl, the aqueous, uh, as we'll discover later in, you know, in a separate video, the a having HCl aqueous means it's hydrochloric acid. If it was HClG, it would be hydrogen chloride, so there's a big difference there. Anyway, we've got hydrochloric acid, so those two substances react together, and they form calcium chloride, uh, which is in solution, that's aqueous. Uh, we have water, you'll notice that water's got an L, and that's really because um, it'll still be present in the solution, but it's it doesn't mean it's meaningless to say liquid, uh, sorry, water dissolved in water. So um, it's L, and then finally we have carbon dioxide being being produced, and we've got G. And so um, I've got the sort of images underneath, sort of trying to sort of represent those. Now, thinking about types of questions they could ask, um, the first is the fact of what observation could you make during this reaction or what observations could you make during this reaction so when they say observations I would say that always think first about what you think you would see uh, there are occasionally other observations that they might uh, um, might be referring to so you can also then think of your senses but they tend to either be it, it, it tends to be about observations that you would see and if we think back, if you think back to previous years when you've done how can you recognise a chemical reaction has taken place, there should have been four things, right? four things, four possible signs. So the first is a, is a colour change. It doesn't mean every reaction involves a colour change, but if there's a colour change, then that's a sign of a chemical reaction. Uh, the second is fizzing or effervescence. Effervescence is just a different word for fizzing. So you, that's because a gas is being produced. And if the gas is being produced in a solution, then you're going to get fizzing. Um, the third is an energy transfer. Now, in terms of what you would um, observe, it would be about a change in temperature. Um, or if you can see light, uh, lights produced, or you can absolutely feel that there's a temperature, uh, there's an energy transfer in, in some way then that would be a sign of a chemical reaction. And I will say that every chemical reaction involves an energy transfer. It's just that sometimes they're not, it's not always abundantly clear unless you've got a thermometer um, in the reaction mixture. And then the final one, the one that most people forget, is um, a precipitation or a precipitate is formed. So either it's a precipitation reaction or a precipitate is formed. Now, what that means, what a precipitate is, is when a solid is formed out of a solution. So, um, uh, again, a rule of thumb, a way of thinking, uh, of, of judging whether a precipitate has been made is, have you started with two, have you started with um, some solutions and have they then subsequently gone cloudy? So if you get a solution going cloudy during the course of a reaction, then is the sign of a precipitate being formed. Now we can judge a couple of those, uh, that whether they, we would make those observations by looking at the state symbols. If you look at this reaction that we've got in front of us, on the left-hand side, we've got a solid reacting with a solution. Uh, and on the right-hand side, we've got a solution, and, well, water is just means solution as far as we're concerned here, and then we have a gas being produced. We would observe two things. We would observe fizzing. We would observe fizzing because we can see that there's a gas on the right-hand side and a solution, an aqueous um, substance, the calcium chloride, and there was no gas on the left. So that gas is being produced during the course of the reaction, it's being produced in the aqueous environment, we would see fizzing. The other observation we could make, and this would be if they were asking for two marks, is that we have a solid on the left and we have no solid on the right. So we would see the calcium carbonate, and it's not a great word, 
Um, and I don't think there's ever really satisfactory ones, but we would see it disappear. So during the course of this reaction, the calcium carbonate powder would disappear and we would be left with no solid, uh, no visible solid um, once the reaction had finished. Um, and during the course of the reaction, we would see fizzing. So those state symbols tell us those observations that we could make. Uh, we're going to look at a, a different reaction now. Um, hopefully one that you're familiar with or what you've seen at least once and, and possibly or probably in biology. And that is um, the test for carbon dioxide. So you would um, know that as, um, as bubbling carbon dioxide through lime water and you would see it go cloudy. So what we've got um, at the bottom here is that reaction. So lime water is actually calcium hydroxide. Um, so you see we've got an aqueous solution, the lime water is aqueous, it would be a colourless solution. Um, we would then bubble the carbon dioxide through it. And the cloudiness is because, if you notice on the right hand side, we've got calcium carbonate as a solid being formed. And so the cloudiness is little tiny particles of solid, little tiny particles of calcium carbonate being formed during the course of the reaction throughout the whole mixture, throughout the whole um, you know, throughout the beaker or the test tube or whatever it is. And so you get those, because you get those little tiny uh, solid particles being formed, you get this cloudiness. If you then left that test tube or beaker or whatever it was, you just left it for a few hours and you came back, what you would find is all of those tiny solid particles had fallen to the bottom and you would have um, mostly colourless and at the bottom you would have your white powder or white solid. Now we can tell that this is a precipitation reaction because on the right hand side we have a solid and on the left hand side we have no solid. So if you, uh, if you see a solid on the right hand side of a reaction equation and no solid on the left hand side at all, then, you, then this, you're going to observe a solid form. You are observing a precipitation reaction. So that, that's our introduction to the state symbols. I mean, to be honest, they could have been introduced anywhere before now. Um, they happen to be in this topic, I think, because now we're going to look at ionic um, compounds and we're going to consider uh, the properties of ionic compounds depending on the state symbol. But really, a lot of what we've just talked about here is relevant uh, beyond this topic. Um, and, and obviously, I'll highlight those points whenever we come to them in, in future videos. OK, so now when we're moving um, into the properties of the of the different um, substances. So we're going to look at ionic compounds, we're going to look at simple um, molecules, we're going to look at giant covalent, and we're going to look at um, metals. So we're going to start first of all with ionic compounds. So you can see there's the specification, what it says there. You can just pause it if you wish to read it. But um, we've got to be able to describe the structure um, with reference to the ions and electrostatic forces. We, we've actually already done that um, in the previous video. Um, we've got to remember that they're high, in, high melting points, boiling points. We've, we said that um, when we did the table um, earlier when we were looking at the particle model. Um, what's going to be new to us now is this, um, whether this is a f uh, property of not being able to conduct electricity when solid, but can when melted or dissolved. Um, and then um, just thinking about their properties beyond that. So this is a description we've had before. This first bullet point is, is essentially a three slash four mark answer. I mean, it depends a little bit on the question. Uh, all of the bits and the color are there to sort of signify the key features here. So you, you must describe, whenever you're talking about a solid uh, ionic compound, you must describe it as a giant ionic lattice and then when you're describing the the bonding the ionic bonding you must make clear that it's strong you must make it clear that there are attractive forces or forces of attraction but they're going to be attractions it isn't it isn't isn't always necessary to put in all directions but i would do that because then you're you're covered and it is true that it's in all directions and then also fundamental because this is what makes it um this is the thing that means it's specifically about ionic compounds and not about something else, is that these electrostatic attractions are between oppositely charged ions. And then if they're asking you why has it got a high melting point, you would state all of those things, and then you would still need to add, so this means a lot of energy is needed to overcome or to melt, or to, but to overcome these forces of attraction. 
Uh, and so I've got a sort of a, not a perfect um, three-dimensional sort of drawing there, but giving the sense of the idea of our lattice um, structure, regular repeating pattern. Um, and we can see that there. We've got oppositely charged ions next to each other. So um, let's think, consider um, ionic compounds um, with, the, with three different state symbols. So let's consider that um, ionic compounds as a solid. Let's consider ionic compounds as a liquid. That's if we've heated and melted them. And then let's consider them as aqueous. That's if we've dissolved um, the ionic compound in water. And let's just think about um, those ions and what we can say about them. Um, so as a solid uh, at the top there, what we're looking at, we're looking at, we can think again about our particle model. And what have we got? Um, we've got ions and they are vibrating about fixed positions. Okay. So fixed positions. The fixed positions is the important bit here. And let's give an example. Uh, let's say, e.g., well, well, let's have sodium chloride because that's just common. So we're saying NaClS here. If we heat it up, if we supply enough energy to overcome uh, the forces of attraction in in our ionic compound enough to melt it, then what we're now what we now have are uh, the ions. And again, thinking about um, the particle model, how would we describe the particles in a in a liquid? Well, we're just changing the word particles to ions. The ions are now free to move, um, and we don't need to worry too much about. Um, the fact that it's uh, they're swapping positions, etc. I just want to I want to focus on whether they're free to move or not. If we think about when um, an ionic compound is dissolved in water, then we are also um, thinking about the ions being free to move. They are not in fixed positions um, anymore. That's the crucial point. Now, the question is about um, which of these uh, different examples, which of these different states are capable of conducting electricity. Now, for there to be, a, if something's to conduct electricity, there must be a flow of charge, right? So you know this from physics, a flow of charge. And so have we got charged particles that can move? Because if we've got to have both of those things, well, in all of them, we've got ions, positive, negative. So in all of them, we have charge. We have charged particles. The question then is, are they free to move? Are they capable of moving? In the solid, no, because they are in fixed positions. So the ions are not free to move. And so a solid, an ionic uh, compound, when in solid form, cannot conduct electricity. If we look at it um, when it's a liquid, um, still got the charged particles, still got the ions, and now they are free to move. Now they are free to carry charge. Oh, now, now the charge can flow, and so we do have a substance that can conduct electricity. And when we look at the ionic compound um, dissolved in water, aqueous, again, we still have the charged particles, we still have the positive and negative ions. They are free to move, they are going to capable of carrying charge, um, and so we, yes, we do have the ability to conduct electricity. So when it comes to the properties of ionic compounds, they have high melting and boiling points. And that's because they have strong electrostatic forces of attraction uh, between oppositely charged ions in all directions in a giant ionic lattice. So a lot of energy is required to overcome those forces of attraction. When it comes to conducting electricity, they can't, ionic compounds can't conduct electricity when solid because the ions are not free to move, they are in fixed positions, but they can conduct when molten, i.e. when a liquid, or when aqueous, because now we, the ions are free to move and carry charge. So now we come to small molecules. So remember from the previous video, uh, the previous one on uh, bonding, um, how we would recognize whether something was a uh, um, molecular or not, was made of molecules, we've got to either have, uh, it was, well, it's non-metals only, and we've either then got to have um, either two different non-metals and or a subscript in the formula. So examples were HCl, um, 
as a, when it's just a molecular substance, when it's a gas, so HCl, um, because we've got uh, two nonmetals. Uh, another example is H2, um, because we may only have one nonmetal, but we've got a subscript number, we've got the little two. And then a final example is CH4. We have two nonmetals and we have a subscript number in the formula. So we've got to remember now the property of um, one property of um, small molecules being their uh, melting slash boiling point. And then we've got to just appreciate um, why that property is the way it is. So we've we've sort of discussed this already. So it's a it's a sort of a reiteration of something that we saw earlier. So all of these simple covalent molecules, certainly the ones that you're going to get in GCSE, they're either going to be um, gases or, or liquids at room temperature. And so the state of matter, the fact it's not a solid, uh, gives us um, a sense that the forces of attraction between the particles are, are weak. And you have to use that word weak. Um, so if you're describing the forces of attraction, you have to say they're weak and you have to say that they're between the molecules or they are intermolecular. And as a consequence, they require little energy to overcome. So that would be three marks. Okay, why is, why is methane a gas at room temperature? Because there are weak intermolecular forces of attraction which require little energy to overcome, or not very much energy. And we can just illustrate that. Um, so I'm just going to draw four methane molecules. Um, so there they are, um, and you'll see that that's the displayed the thing shown as displayed in the displayed formula. And you'll see in um, revision guides books, you'll see sort of dashes between them. They may use water, they may use a different substance, but it'll be a simple molecule. Now those dashes are representing the weak intermolecular forces. Okay, and then then don't forget that the actual lines here are uh, the strong covalent bonds. So one thing I just want to stress is it's never, ever the strong covalent bonds that get broken when we're talking about simple molecules. It's only ever the weak intermolecular forces of attraction between the molecules. Those are the only things that matter when we're changing state. Now we use that word, we've used that word weak, um, and Whenever we're using weak or strong, really what we're saying is relative to other substances. So when we did the particle model table earlier with the different, the four different, um, you know, this ionic, simple molecular, um, giant covalent and metallic or metals, um, we were talking about very strong, strong, weak forces of attraction. And really we're using those terms in comparison to each other. So very strong compared to everything else. Strong compared to um, to simple molecules. Weak compared to the others and so on. But it is possible, it doesn't mean, sorry, that all of the forces of attraction in all simple molecules or in all molecular substances are equal, right? Some can be stronger or weaker. Now, one of the things that you had to learn in the very first chemistry unit, which was atomic structure and the periodic table, was the boiling point trend of the group seven elements, the halogens. So uh, one of the things that you had to remember was that the boiling point increased. And just seeing the states of matter shows us that. So fluorine is a gas, chlorine is a gas, bromine is a liquid, iodine is a solid. So they're all at the same temperature, but they are at different states. So that's telling us the boiling point is increasing. The iodine hasn't even um, is still a solid. Bromine hasn't has has melted, but hasn't boiled. Now remember that um, I said that the state at room temperature was um, was a useful rule of thumb for thinking about the forces of attraction and their strength. So these are all simple molecules, um, because if we remember, these are all diatomic, right? So they are F2 and Cl2 and uh, Br2 and I2. And so if I was doing them as displayed formulae, it would be F covalent bond F, Cl covalent bond Cl, Br covalent bond Br, and I covalent bond I. So thinking about our particle model, each one of those is the particle. 
All right, and we've talked about intermolecular forces when we have simple molecules. So what can we say, though, about the relative intermolecular forces compared to each other? Well, fluorine's a gas, chlorine's a gas, bromine's a liquid, iodine's a solid. We've got the boiling point increasing as we go down the group. So that tells us that the intermolecular forces are getting stronger. As you go down this group, they are getting stronger. In fact, they are so strong in iodine that it is still a solid. Now, how can we explain this? So the other piece of information I've got in this table here is the mass number. Um, and you can see that the mass number is increasing. Um, now, that isn't proof, um, but I want you to, to take from me that actually the larger a molecule is, and um, the simplest way of judging that is what would be its total mass, uh, the larger a molecule is, the stronger the intermolecular forces. So that mass number is increasing, the intermolecular forces is increasing, the boiling point is increasing. Now we also have to appreciate that small molecules don't conduct electricity. This is, this is actually going to be a very sort of short and simple statement. If you remember when we were just looking at ionic compounds just before, we said um, that for something to conduct electricity, there's going to have to be um, a flow of charge, or whenever there's an electric current, there's a flow of charge. So we've got to decide, firstly, is, are there any charged particles? And then secondly, are they able to move? Can we then have the flow of charged particles? When it comes to small molecules, they, they don't have any mobile charges. So really, the charges that are going to be capable of moving are going to be either delocalized electrons um, or they've got to be free moving ions. They've got to be uh, ions that are capable of moving. Small molecules have neither. They don't have any delocalized electrons. They don't have any ions. So they are very poor conductors of electricity. Uh, back in the, the first video, uh, the bonding video, um, we looked very briefly at polymers. And if you remember, um, poly meant many and um, mers meant parts. So we were talking about um, very large molecules, um, an example being um, uh, polythene, um, so something that you're familiar with. And basically, if you think of any plastic, um, that will be a polymer. So there are just, uh, there's a very short bit about um, their properties that we've just got to be aware of, and it builds actually on what we've been doing on simple molecules. So polymers are still molecular, um, but they're not um, they're not simple, so they're very very large. And one of the things that we did when we or we realised when we looked at the halogens and their boiling point um, just earlier was that uh, the larger a molecule is, and we can think of its mass, but the larger a molecule is, uh, the stronger the intermolecular forces. Now this we're just seeing a fraction of a polymer here, but you can see it's huge. So we have very strong. Oh, we have a lot actually, sorry, is what I want to say. We have very, we have a lot of intermolecular forces between the very large molecules, the very long chains. Imagine that I've done that all the way along. So even though those individual forces are quite weak, if you have enough of them, um, they can get very, very, um, they can become very strong in total. So I, I guess an analogy would be, imagine if you were sticking something together uh, with glue, if you just did a small uh, strip of glue, that wouldn't be as strong as doing a longer strip of glue. It's the same glue, but the very fact that you've got um, more uh, surface or greater surface um, touching, being stuck together, the stronger in, in, in it's going to be. Same with something like Velcro. You could have a tiny little Velcro patch or you could have a very long Velcro patch. They're both Velcro, but one would be much stronger than the other. So even though we're talking about a molecular substance, even though we're talking about intermolecular forces, when it comes to something like a polymer, which is a very, very, very large molecule, then we are talking about those intermolecular forces being strong. And if we go back to our rule of thumb, our rule of thumb was if it was a solid at room temperature, then the forces of attraction were, were strong or are strong. Uh, if you think of every plastic that you know of, it's a solid at room temperature. So... Um, that is the learning objective. Um, that, so that's sort of sort of essentially from the spec. I've, I've I've actually just explained all this, and there's a there's a description of what I've just basically been saying. So you can pause the video if you wish and and just read that. 
So now we come to giant covalent structures. Um, so diamond, graphite, silicon dioxide are the ones are the examples that they initially want you to be aware of. We did very briefly look at them. Um, all of them are solid. Um, that's already telling us that they've got high melting points and therefore um, there are strong strong forces of attraction that have to be over overcome. That's because they all have covalent bonds um, and it's a giant lattice of covalent bonds. Um, we know that covalent bonds are very strong. So if these substances are going to change state, we have to break a lot of strong covalent bonds and that is going to require a lot of energy. So here, here are some, uh, here are the three structures, um, just to sort of uh, help you recognize them. We're going to come back to them later. So we've got graphite on the right. Remember that's just made of carbon atoms. Um, we've got diamond in the middle that is also just made of carbon atoms. So we haven't changed the type of bond. We haven't changed the type of atom, but what has changed is how they are arranged. So the arrangement makes a big difference um, to their properties as we'll discover. And then on the right hand side, we've got silicon dioxide, uh, which is sand. So again, we were using that term giant lattice structures. They are just, just full of covalent bonds and so if we're going to melt them we're going to have to break all of those strong covalent bonds and that's going to require a lot of energy and the more energy that's required uh, the higher the melting point higher the boiling point so shortly we're going to look at um, uh, some of these giant covalent structures in um, greater detail but just before we do that we're going to focus first of all on metals so we're going to look now at the properties of metals and we're also going to learn about um, something called alloys. So I'll let you just read through those um, objectives, the things that are essentially taken from the spec. By all means, pause the video and then we're going to talk about the properties of metals and alloys specifically. Okay, so uh, one of the... One of the... Um, things in the specification earlier on in the previous video was that you had to recognize a particular representation of metals and metallic bonding and it was something like this so they'll have you, you've got that very nice um, regular arrangement repeating regular arrangement um, so that's clearly a lattice structure um, those particles now if we're thinking about a particle diagram in a metal they are, they are positive metal ions and they are arranged in nice nice layers and then typically what they'll do is they'll show the delocalized electrons more as a shading rather than individual like electron particles. Um, so, and our metallic bonding is the electrostatic attraction between those positive metal ions and those negatively charged delocalized electrons. Now, one of the features or properties of metals that you might remember from earlier in your school uh, life is the fact that metals can be shaped and um, and bent, you know, basically shaped, sorry, that's really what we want to say. Uh, and there was a word for that, and that word was uh, malleable. So the fact that metals are malleable, that's one of their properties. Now, the reason that they are malleable is the fact that is because the layers are able to slide over each other. So that is a, that's a two mark answer, believe it or not. So if they're asking you how, what, how or why are metals able to be shaped or why are they malleable, then you're going to talk about the fact that the ions are in layers. It says atoms there. Atoms, ions, they're, they're probably going to be fairly loose with that in, in the mark scheme, but actually, strictly speaking, they're ions, aren't they? So those layers of ions are able to slide over each other, and so the slide over is the second mark, right? And that gives them that malleable feature. So if we were to push from one direction, uh, that layer could slide over the the one beneath it and that's essentially what's happening when we're shaping metals now it is possible to strengthen metals so um, iron is uh, obviously an element it's on the periodic table um, if you add um, a certain proportion of of carbon atoms um, then iron becomes steel and steel is a stronger substance than iron and there are also other types of steel like stainless steel so they'll have other atoms in present with the ions such as chromium for example so how is it though that adding 
these different atoms to our original metal, how is it that they are able to change its properties, in this case the strength, so that the, the new mixture, because it, it will be a mixture, um, or the mixture that's produced is, is stronger. And it's going to be to do with these layers. So when we add our second substance, we are inevitably adding um, particles with different sizes to what the original was. So we cannot get those nice, nice layers anymore. We get those layers, those layers are disrupted or distorted. Distorted is a really good word. Disrupted is a really good word. So when you now have that mixture of different size atoms, you've now got, you don't, sorry, you no longer have those nice, neat, regular layers. So they are, it's much, much harder for them to slide over each other. And so that would be our answer. Why is our alloy stronger than our um, elemental metal? because the layers are distorted, because there are atoms of different sizes, and this makes it difficult for the layers to slide over each other. And that, is, that is why alloys are stronger than the original elemental metal that they make mostly comprise of. So this is why steel is stronger than iron. Another feature of uh, metals or property of metals that you'll uh, remember from earlier in school, um, and that you sort of recognize anyway, I'm sure, is that metals are um, particularly good conductors of electricity and of um, heat. Um, and the reason that they are both of these is going to be, or is because of these delocalized electrons that we've learned about when we, when we learned about bonding earlier. So by saying that the electrons are delocalized, we're saying that they're free to move. And in general, they will just be moving in random directions all the way through the structure. But if you apply a potential difference, right, so if you put a power pack or uh, you have a power pack or a battery or something like that, then what you then are doing is you're saying you're forcing um, the electrons to all move in the same direction. And then you have your flow of charge, then you have your current, then you have your, uh, then, you've, then you've got electricity being conducted. So... They are good conductors of electricity because of the delocalized electrons. The delocalized electrons are also relevant for our explanation of why metals are good conductors of heat. So those electrons are moving around, they're free to move, they're moving in random directions and so on. If you apply, um, if you heat a, a metal, then um, what you're going to do is you're going to make the electrons near that heat source move faster and faster and they are going to collide with those metal ions and if they're colliding with those metal ions they're going to make them vibrate more and if they're vibrating more then they are then there is they have more energy and then they collide with the ions next to them and the electrons also collide with the ions further down and so we get the passing along of energy and that is the conduction of um that is the conduction of heat so again, um, it's the delocalized electrons that are responsible for this particular property of metals. Now, some metals are better conductors than others. Um, so um, all of the wiring um, in your house, um, you know, in your TVs, and if you've got a, a computer or whatever in your plugs, whatever in your plugs, that's going to be copper. Copper is a particularly good um, conductor of electricity. Silver is even better, but you can think that one of the reasons there that we don't use silver is because that is much more expensive than copper. So what main factor affects conductivity is essentially how easy it is for the electrons to flow through the metal structure. So we're going to focus now on um, carbon um, and uh, the different structures that carbon can form. So I'm going to start first of all with um, with diamonds. So we've already seen a, um, a sort of a diagram, I'm not a terribly clear one, admittedly, but we've seen a, di a diagram of diamonds and we've seen this giant lattice structure in diamond. We've also talked about the fact that there are many strong covalent bonds in that structure. So we're just going to remind ourselves about that, but we're also going to um, understand why diamond is, is as hard as it is. It's a very, very hard substance. Um, just again appreciate why a substance like diamond doesn't conduct electricity and we're going to explain all of these things think, by considering its structure and its bonding. So on the left hand side um, we've got um, quite often how they will show the structure of diamond in a 
exam question, I don't find it terribly helpful because it doesn't really give you the sense of a giant lattice. And even the one on the right, which, you know, shows more, I think gives a better idea of a regular repeating pattern. But even that is is doesn't give this idea the sense of it going on and on and on and on. But the the the, the picture on the left, the the diagram, the sort of structure on the left does allow us to to be able to focus on some on certain features of diamond. So one of these is that each carbon atom has four covalent bonds or is bonded to four other carbon atoms. Uh, it has, you can see it's a sort of 3D lattice. Um, it has a very rigid structure. There are no clear layers. That explains why it's hard, right? Why it's very hard. It's made only of carbon atoms, so we have no delocalized electrons. We have no ions, so it doesn't conduct electricity. There are, there are no charged particles that can move. There's a, an image that hopefully just gives a a clearer sense of that that giant structure that giant lattice structure that regular repeating pattern where there are just lots and lots and lots of covalent bonds and we would need to break all of those covalent bonds to melt diamond and that would require a lot of energy so graphite is 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 an allotrope of carbon and diamond is an allotrope of carbon so all that means is uh, they are different structures of the same um substance and graphite has very different properties uh, mostly anyway um, to diamond so whereas diamond is very hard what we get with graphite is it's soft and slippery I mean and that's very important because otherwise it wouldn't be useful uh, in pencils uh, it does like diamond have a high melting point although its melting point isn't as high as diamonds um, and it does conduct electricity so this is very unusual for a non-metal substance so each one of those um, black dots is a carbon atom. And one of the things that you can hopefully get from this is the fact that we have layers of atoms. Okay. Now unusually, between the layers are weak forces of attraction. That means the layers can slide over each other very easily. Uh, and that's what makes, or that's why graphite is um, so, as a soft substance uh, and a slippery substance. So believe it or not, um, graphite can actually, or is actually a good lubricant in certain situations. And now hopefully you recall that uh, when we just looked at diamonds, um, each carbon atom had uh, four covalent bonds. If you look at a uh, carbon atom here, and uh, we'll pick one sort of that's sort of in the middle of the structure. So uh, let's pick that one there. Um, each carbon atom is bonded or has only three covalent bonds. Now, carbon has four electrons uh, in its outer shell. If it has in this in graphite three covalent bonds, that means only uh, three of those four are being used in covalent bonding which means there is one electron left over, a spare electron, and that spare electron becomes delocalized. So now every carbon atom has supplied one electron and we have two, one delocalized electron. So that means graphite is capable of conducting electricity, a property that is very unusual for a non-metal. And then the last thing I just want to point out is the fact um, that those that we've got hexagons. Um, so the carbon atoms are arranged in hexagons. All right, just, just something useful to remember because just occasionally they ask you to draw a layer. Um, there's just a larger image trying to show lots and lots and lots of layers of graphite just to make it a little bit clearer that we still have this giant covalent structure. Of course, those layers would still extend much 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 further than that image shows now if you just take one of those layers that made up graphite so if you remember graphite was layers and uh, was one layer on top of another layer on top of another layer of these um, hexagonal carbon um, structures 
if you just took one of those layers, that actually results in a substance called um, graphene. So <laughs> graphene is both similar and different to graphite. So you would expect it to be similar if it's one layer of graphite. Now, its similarity is in the fact that it, uh, it also has each carbon atom only bonded uh, with only three covalent bonds. So that means we also have delocalized electron from each carbon atom, which means that we also have that graphene is also capable of conducting electricity just as graphite was. Uh, we would still need to break many covalent bonds um, if we were to melt uh, graphene. So just as with graphite, just as with diamond, um, it's, got a, it's got a very high melting point. So many strong covalent bonds in a giant lattice structure need to be broken, so a lot of energy is needed. However, where graphite was soft and slippery, and that was because the layers could slide over each other, graphene is a single layer. So as such, it's actually a very strong substance. And then the last thing um, to mention is that because it's just one layer of graphite, it's one atom thick. And this is going to sound a little bit bizarre, but as far as your exam board is concerned, um, this means that um, graphene is a two-dimensional structure. Okay. We've since discovered uh, other ways of um, other structures of uh, uh, involving just the carbon atom, and these are called fullerenes. And the first one to be discovered was Buckminster fullerene. Uh, and as we'll see, that has a spherical shape. But we can, we've since been able to make other um, fullerenes. So there's tubular or they're cylindrical, um, and they have very high length to diameter ratios. That makes them useful for all sorts of nanotechnology and nano substances. So they're used in uh, or used in medicine, used in um, a variety of uh, electronics. Uh, and you just really have to be able to just sort of um, appreciate what they are and be able to recognize them. Um, so this is Buckminster Fullerene. Um, so unusually, this is the only, well, unusually is it has a very specific um, formula. Um, so the formula of Buckminster Fullerene is C60. So that is molecular. So graphite and diamond are giant covalent structures, but Buckminster Fullerene is molecular. There is a discrete unit. We could, if we did our particle model, each particle would be a C60 molecule. Um, and then there are um, the nanotubes, um, of which there are a couple of examples here. So if you look at this, they're not sealed at the end. They can be sealed at the end. Um, so they can sort of be closed off at each end. But if you if you look at the versions that we've got here, uh, they're essentially a graphene sheet rolled into a tube. So many of the properties that we think of or that we know that graphene has would be applicable for these particular tubes that I'm showing here. So, for example, they're good conductors of, of, of heat and electricity because just as with graphene, they have each carbon atom has a delocalized electron which can carry charge throughout the structure. And then in terms of their uses, why are they useful? Um, the reasons are uh, that it's believed that they um, provide a way of uh, delivering drugs in medicine. Um, so um, they would act as a capsule, if you like, for a, a drug molecule or molecules, um, which would be then targeted at a specific part of the body. So they would basically be the delivery method for that drug. And another use is as a catalyst or as catalysts. Now, we haven't done catalysts yet um, formally. Um, they are substances that speed up the rate of a reaction, how quickly a reaction takes place or how fast a reaction takes place. So the rate of the reaction um, without actually being used up themselves. And uh, one feature of some catalysts is that they have a very large surface area. And so that's what's relevant here with um, the fullerenes. That will make more sense once we actually do catalysts, but just bear in mind that in terms of their uses, uh, they have the potential to act as uh, useful catalysts in certain situations. So that, that finishes the second part of the structure and bonding, um, or the second video of structure and bonding. Um, it's a huge topic, it's a difficult topic, it's a very important topic. So if you have any queries about anything that we've covered, please let me know.